This workshop's rated MA, just so you know. That means that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to use some, maybe some explicit language. There's going to be some adult themes. I'll probably throw out a couple bad jokes. You can blame my joke writer for that. And then this may not be suitable for restaurants that really actually condone mediocrity. So viewer discretion is always advised. Here's the rules for today. The rules for today are this, pretty simple. Number one, I want you to have some fun. Number two, I want you to take notes if you can. Even if you have an iPhone, iPad, or a plain old fashioned piece of paper and a pen, if you write things down in your own handwriting, you're 70% more likely to retain the information. And number three, every once in a while you're gonna see me do this. I'm gonna say hashtag WTSD. What does hashtag WTSD mean? It's pretty simple. It means write this shit down. All right. When I say hashtag WTSD, those are the little gold nuggets I'm going to give you. Now, in my first book, Your Restaurant Sucks, I have a great quote right in the beginning. It says, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off. Anybody here ever been to Vegas before? I mean, I love Vegas. Now, like you, you're in an educational seminar. I go to educational seminars a lot, too. I love, like, the big motivational speakers. I was in Vegas and I was listening to this speaker, oh my God, he was fantastic. I mean, really, like Tony Robbins style, lit the room up. Really, I was like taking notes like crazy. And then he said something I'll never forget. He said, knowledge is power. And I, it kind of made me stop. And I sat there for a second. I sat up and I started thinking about that. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. And then I said to myself, actually, I think I said it out loud. I said, you know, that's bullshit. That's a bunch of bullshit. All right, have you ever heard anybody say to you also, and you probably hear a lot of consultants out there saying, you know what you need? You just need, you need the right tools. All you need is the tools. If you have the right tools, you know, I, you know if I, uh, what you need is a, a new checklist. A new checklist, it'll fix everything. And then they go, no, 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 no. What you need is you need my new software system. My new software system will solve everything. It'll make your restaurant 100% better with my new software. Okay, tools... All those things, knowledge, you know what they are really? They're just potential. If I have a hammer laying on the table, a hammer itself is just potential. It's not until I pick the hammer up and actually apply it. And I can pick that hammer up, I could build a house, I could hang pictures of my loved ones, I could do all kinds of things with a hammer. Or I could turn the hammer around, I could hit someone in the head and go to jail for a very long time. How you apply the tool is what, ha what matters. So tools are just potential. My books, I mean, I have a couple books out. My books are full of potential. If you read them, you have knowledge. When you apply it, you actually have power. And that's what I want to talk about today. If you've never met before, my name is Donald Burns. I'm known as the restaurant coach. I grew up in the industry. My father was a chef. I started like everyone else at 15 washing dishes. I worked my way up through the kitchen brigade. When I was 18, my dad told me it was in my blood. I said, I want a transfusion. I don't want to do this. So I did what a lot of kids do when they have a very dominant male figure. I took off and joined the Air Force. And I was supposed to go into language school, actually Russian language school, but a funny thing happened when I was, at language, when I was in basic training. This guy came in and showed this film of these guys jumping out of helicopters, Halo jumping, repelling, scuba diving, combat search and rescue. I said, that looks a lot more fun. So I tried out for a team called Pararescue. I actually, we started with 90-something guys. A year and a half later, 11 of us graduated. After my time in the military, I went back to college. In college, I found, without my dad yelling and screaming at me, I actually liked the restaurant industry. So I started working with the right chefs, working in the right places. At 30, I opened my first restaurant. At 33, I opened my second restaurant. I sold them both. I got recruited by a chef. You might have heard of him before, Wolfgang Puck. I went and was a chef with Wolfgang Puck for five years. Went around the country opening restaurants for Wolf. And then I started my own consulting company. That's my story in a handbasket right there. Ooh. I'm going to tell you right now, restaurant success is not rocket science. Everyone tries to make it very complex. Restaurant success is not rocket science. What it is, it's people science. And the thing I always tell people, you can actually, you can put this on my tombstone. All business problems are people problems. All business problems are people problems. Hashtag WTSD, write this shit down. All business problems are people problems. 
what coaching does is I actually work on the people problems. And there is a recipe. And there's actually, when I look at restaurants, and I, you know, I've traveled all around the world. All, restu- all restaurants kind of fall into what I call four different kind of growth cycles. And it's kind of like a pyramid. And not that pyramid. I got a really sexy one for you. I call this the restaurant profit pyramid. Starting at the very bottom are what I call the struggling restaurants or the bad restaurants. In any market, they make up 20% of the market. And this, this, this theory works anywhere in the world. I've applied it everywhere. In any market I go to, 20% of the restaurants are bad. They usually are losing money or breaking even. I'm going to tell you right now, if your goal is to break even, you need a better goal. That's not, breaking even is not a good goal, okay? You've got to have a better goal than that. And I always say these are below. If it, this was school and it's like on the bell curve, your bad restaurants are like your DNF students. Usually the owners are very frustrated. They feel overwhelmed. They're working so many hours in a restaurant. How many people work 70, 80, 90 hours in a restaurant? I hope not, please. I have people. I have a, I have a client who just started with me. Last week he pulled 85 hours. I said, we're going to stop that because that's not a life. That's being chained to your restaurant. It's being handcuffed to your restaurant. Their turnover is super high. The one I really look at is the culture. The culture here is basically what I call default, or you could call it the wild, wild west. This is where the team runs the show. The manager tends to hide in the, in the, in the office. He's afraid to come out, or she's afraid to come out. They hide in the office. They're afraid to come out. The, the culture there is really, really just total chaos, a lot of drama. Every, everyone's seen restaurants like that, right? I mean, yeah, that's crazy. The thing they focus on here is their product. It's the only thing they know. They know their menu. They know that, oh, we just need some different items. We need a different menu. We need a new menu. We need some new stuff. That's where they focus on at this level. And the keys to success is that they really need to dial in their niche. They really need to become specific. And they got to start getting control of their restaurant. The next level up is what I call surviving. And the surviving category is what I call good. In any market I go to, 60% of restaurants are what I call good. Good to me is what I call average. You're basically doing the national average as far as profitability. Your error is 0% or up to 6% profit. That's what I call good. Again, if that's your goal, you need a bigger goal. Restaurants here are average, and school this will be your C students. Now, the owners are a little exhausted, but they're very determined. They start to see a little bit of movement in the right direction. They're working pretty solid hours still, 50, 60, 70 still, but they're not killing themselves as they, as they were at the lower level. The culture here is more by design, and it's actually what I call a training culture. 60% of all restaurants, actually 80% if you take the first two together, 80% of all restaurants have what I call a training culture. What's a training culture? It's when you train just on the front end. When somebody works with you, they get hired, and you only do training at the beginning. It's usually that three-day follow. <clears throat> hey, follow Joe around for three days, do what he does, says what he says, and you're good. That's a training culture. Most restaurants have a training culture. When you're at this level, too, you start looking at systems a little bit. You start looking at checklists. You start getting your recipe cards dialed in. And then the goal to success here is actually start using the systems consistently. I know a lot of people start off a system, but then they don't keep it going all the time. The next level up is what I call thriving these would be like the B students, <clears throat> and they're what I call the great restaurants. 50% of any restaurant in a market is what I call, is what I call great. Now, their profit potential is usually 7 to 15%. That's what I call a great restaurant, 7 to 15%. And they're basically what I call evolutionary. They have a renewed, revived energy. They have very low turnover. The owners work in a normal kind of week, 40 hours, maybe 50 at the max. The, the, the culture here is what, I've, what I, hey, I want everyone to shift to. It's called a learning culture. When you shift to a learning culture, basically here's what happens. You're always training. Hashtag, write this down. Always be training. You should have, who has a marketing calendar? Anybody have a marketing calendar? I always ask this. I always have a few hands. Then I ask this question. Who has a training calendar? Oh, wow, the same people. That's cool. That's good. You should have a marketing calendar. You should have a training calendar. You should always be training just like you are always be marketing. You should always be that. The focus here at this level is more on strategy. How do we make ourselves a little bit better than the competition? How do we out, actually outposition them 
in our market. That's at this, this level here. And the keys to success really goes to forecasting, budgeting, really getting tighter on the labor controls, looking at certain numbers. And then the last level at the very top, only 5% of restaurants ever make it there. It's what I call the outstanding restaurants. And what do I mean by outstanding? I mean you stand out so far ahead that you don't have competition anymore. People start copying you. That's those brands where people like start knocking your stuff off and you have people on your team, hey man, they knocked off our chicken sandwich, they knocked off our salad, they knocked off this. I love it when people do that. It's like, great, I know where I'm at now. I'm out in front and they're copying me. That's where I want to be. Profit here is usually 18% or higher when you're at the outstanding category. When I do my coaching clients, my goal is to get all my clients to the outstanding level. That's my goal, is my goal. And I have clients that actually, percent, that actually surpass that 18% mark all the time. This is the symptoms here. This is that kind of admired kind of brand that people want to copy again. The culture here is focused on leadership. They actually want to make a legacy. They want to leave an imprint. They don't want to just be great. They want to, just leave, they want to, have, they want to leave a dent in the world. The focus here is on people. When you're at this level, you realize that it's the people you hire that make or break your restaurant. And then you really want to, you really want to work on recruiting top, top talent. When you're at this level, I tell you, people can actually come looking for you to work. You don't really have to struggle. Who here is struggling trying to find people to work? If you're struggling to find people to work, you want to elevate your culture. And you also want to market your culture. And I'll talk about that a little bit. So where's your restaurant at now? You could easily take it. There's a little, a little quiz I have. It's called the restaurant checkup. Go back. She wants me to go back. I think it's going to start over. Oh, there it goes. You want a picture of it? You know, I'll send you the picture. <laughs> if you go to restaurantcheckup.com, you actually can take a quiz and it'll tell you what level you're at. Now, fair warning, when you go to restaurantcheckup.com, I will email the shit out of you. <laughs> So if you do not want my email, it's just opt out, okay? I'm just telling you right now. When you go to Restaurant Checkup, take the quiz, I will email you. If you don't want the emails, that's cool too. Just opt out. That's all I ask, all right? I always want to give you a fair warning. People are like, I, hey, I didn't know I was going to get like 25 emails from you, Donald. Uh, yeah, that's what I do, you know? Culture. I'm telling you, culture is the defining thing that separates the good, the great from outstanding. We looked at that pyramid, I'm telling you, from good to great, outstanding, the thing that separates those ones is all culture, all the time. I'm a big believer in process maps. If there's a process for everything in life, all I always do is I look at, when I'm looking at problems, I basically look at, it basically needs a process. And I just reverse engineer everything to get the result I want. So the recipe to restaurant success, <clears throat> it's pretty complex. But it, it's pretty simple, actually. And I'll show you the simple recipe. It's complex yet simple. And I said simple, I said not easy. We all know what happens when we follow a recipe. We get consistent results, correct? <clears throat> if I go in the kitchen and I grab 12 random items, <clears throat> throw them in a bowl, throw it in a, in, a, in a little pie pan, throw it in the oven, try to bake it for 10 minutes, what do you think my results are going to be? Not good, right? But I tell you, that's how most restaurant owners operate every day. They throw a bunch of people together without knowing their different recipes, with knowing what makes them tick. We put them together, we try to make them be a team, and then we wonder how come it's not working. It's because you got the recipe wrong. I will give you the recipe to success right here. The three Ps, hashtag write this down. It's pretty simple, too. It's people, product, process. <clears throat> People, product, process. That's the recipe to restaurant success. Here's the thing you have to understand. Just like in your recipe cards, the secret's having the right amounts in the right order. Most people have the order wrong. When I talk about people, what am I talking about? I'm talking about your training. I'm talking about recruiting. I'm talking about mindset. I'm talking about behavioral assessments to know the strengths of my team, where to put them in on the right spot. I'm looking at hiring. When I'm talking about product, I'm talking about my marketing avatars. I'm talking about my menu. I'm talking about menu psychology. I'm talking about 
how my food costs. I'm talking about menu design. And when I talk about process, I'm talking about systems, communication. I'm talking about implementation, strategic planning, KPIs, key performance indicators. Those are all the things that go into it. And the thing that binds them together is what I call mindset and habits. Now, it looks like it's a small binder, but it's a huge binder that pulls them all together. <clears throat> Here's what happens with most restaurants. Most restaurants focus on the one thing they know, which is product. Everyone has a menu, right? You all have a product. You all have a menu. After they have a product, the next thing they do is they start realizing, oh, crap, I need some checklist in place. So then they start doing some process. They have checklists. They may start standardizing their recipes. And then the last thing they start looking at is the people part. <clears throat> this is critical to success right here. People feed the process. And process feeds the people. What do I mean by that? <clears throat> have you ever had people not follow your checklist? Yes? Right. And I have, rest I have clients call me all the time. Donald, they don't, they're not following my checklist. So I ask them, all right, is the checklist bad? Is it a bad checklist? No, it's a great checklist. All right, well then look at the, look at the 3P framework. What part of the equation is not working? People. I'm not either training them properly, training them enough. Here's the thing I want you to do, hashtag write this down. Never train your people just enough. You don't train them till they know. You train them till they don't know any different, right? You wanna train all the bad habits out of your people. Train the bad habits out of your people by constantly, constantly training. So people feed the process, and also process feeds the people. I've had owners also contact me. What do I do, man? I come in, I, you know, I took a little break, I come in the afternoon, I come back, and the team's just standing around. I say, well, they have lists to do, they have running side work, they have things to do, they have an action plan. No, then you don't have a process. Write this down, too. In the absence of standards and conversation, the team will make their own. And unfortunately, the ones they make is not good for you. It's usually what's best for them. When you have these two working in synergy, if I look at like a big circle, people process, people process, people process, what it does, it forms a protective barrier around your product. And if I said another word for product, I could say would be your brand. So people in process protect the product. Here's where people go wrong. People, product, process. Most people think it's equal parts. They say people, product, process. One third, one third, one third, right? No. It's actually more like this. <clears throat> it's 60% people, 20% product and process. And if I broke it down even farther for the real recipe to success, I'm telling you right now, I've seen this. I've been in the restaurant industry 40 years. I've been coaching for 12 years. I've worked with 2,100 restaurants. Mindset and systems and strategy. 80% is mindset. It's your attitude, your beliefs, your kind of what you bring to the table. And then it's only 20% systems and strategy. This is my roadmap, what I teach my clients. I call it the restaurant accelerator. And it's a process map. And we take everyone through the different parts, people, product, process. Today, I'm gonna take you through two little sections. I'm gonna take you through a part of my extreme menu makeover. I'm going to take you a little bit through my profit clinic workshops. Now, these workshops are normally like 10, 12-hour workshops each one. So, unfortunately, I can't get it all today. But I'll give you like a little, a little bit of every one. And I'll give you some stuff that you can actually start applying today to your restaurant. Let's talk about what I call as M cubed. M cubed. What's M cubed? Mindset, menu, money. That's the three things we're going to talk about today. M cubed. Mindset. Menu, money. How do we do that? Start with mindset. Remember I said mindset is 80%, system strategy 20. Here's what I want you to do. Write this down, please. You have to raise your standards. You have to raise your standards. Nothing in your restaurant, I'm just telling you, nothing in your restaurant will improve. Nothing in your life will improve. Nothing in your finances will improve until you raise your standards. We all have things that we want. We don't get what we want. We get what we have to have. We all get what we tolerate. 
in ourselves and in others. But when you're no longer willing to tolerate something, that's when your restaurant changes. Remember when I talked about that pyramid? The good, the great, the outstanding? I said culture separates them. You know what develops culture? Standards. The difference between each, cult, each different level is standards, period. What's the difference between a regular average restaurant and a Michelin star restaurant? Standards. It's really, when you look down to it, yes, there's some technical skill available, some advanced stuff. But when you look down to the basic level, what's the difference between a one Michelin star and a three Michelin star? Standards. That's it. The difference is always standards. I love this slide. I always, I always tell people this. A standard is called a standard because it's a standard. It's not called a flexible option. <clears throat> Your team has what I call non-negotiables with you. You need to establish non-negotiables with them. And what do I mean by non-negotiable? Everyone here pays their team, right? What if it was payday and, you know, John came up to me and it was payday. He came to get his check and I go, you know, I decided what I'm going to do is I'm going to pay you next Wednesday instead, and I'm only going to pay you half what I told you I was going to pay you. What would that employee do? Freak the out, right? Because they have a non-negotiable. No, you told me you were going to pay me on every other Friday. You told me you were going to pay me this amount. I'm here for my check. You need to push back and have non-negotiables too. I want it done like this. I want the food like this. I want the recipes followed like this. I want the kitchen clean like this. You got to establish your non-negotiables too. Everyone, I tell you, people seem to only change when the storm comes in. I'm inviting you right now to kind of create your own little 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 shit storm every day. <laughs> okay, put the pressure on yourself to get better. Put the pressure on yourself to elevate your standards. Put the pressure on yourself to learn something new. I find there's a huge there's a huge correlation between restaurant success and the learning culture of the owners. When the owners have adapted a learning kind of mindset and they want to learn and grow and become better, their team actually does too. Hashtag write this down. Restaurants become better when the people in them become better people. It's pretty simple, right? Restaurants become better when the people in them become better people. Here's why most restaurants are stuck. Here's probably why you're stuck. You do this. You should all over yourself, <laughs> okay? You all have a list of things you know you should do in your restaurant. I should cost out my menu. I should market more using video. I should, you know, do more video marketing. I should fire that negative energy vampire sucking the life out of me and everyone on my team. I should, I should, I should, I should, I should. You just should all over yourself all day, all week. Here's one thing. Take that word should and just convert it. Just twist it into one thing. Change it into a must. Instead of, I should cost out my menu, I must cost out my menu. I, I should market more, I must market more. Right? I should use more video. No, I must use more video. I must fire that negative energy vampire. I must fire that negative energy. Who, who right now, when I said negative energy vampire, thought of someone on their team? Your, your mission? Go back and get rid of that person if you can. Every time I say that, someone's like, yep, I know exactly who he's talking about. Menu. This little part is from my Extreme Menu Makeover kind of workshop. I'm going to show you how to increase guest check average, how to turn your, your menu into an ATM. These are simple, simple tricks you can use. Simple tricks. The first one is called the one-point font change. Now, if you look at this menu, it might be hard to see, especially you people in the back row, unless you have really good vision. For argument's sake, I'm going to tell you what the font sizes are. On this menu here, the buffalo ribeye, the ribeye, the veal meatloaf, the pork chop, and the roasted chicken are all 12 points. The one in the middle, the brown sugar beef tenderloin, is 13 points. It's a one-point font change. Now, you might say, Donald, one point's not a really big difference. Exactly. Because your brain is wired to notice differences. That's why we survived from beating eating by saber-toothed tigers. The, the people in the gene pool that did not see those differences, like, they're dead. They got eaten. But you're here because your brain's wired for survival. 
if I put a one-point font change on this thing, what happens is we look at it again real quick, just like something weird about that. You don't know what it is, but your brain's wired to look for differences. If I get another chance to look at it again, what it does, is it creates an opportunity to, for them to think about it again, which also makes the opportunity to sell it much more better. Much more better. Better. Much more better. The one-point font change is an easy one. Here's one of my favorite ones. I call it the bold word. Now, this menu looks pretty straightforward, right? Kobe beef sliders, lobster wontons, cornmeal dusted calamari, baked brie. Ready? Don't blink. You're going to see a difference. All I did was bold out a couple words to draw your eye to it. This is like the easiest menu design trick in the world. So now, right now, it's Kobe beef, lobster, calamari, brie. If I like calamari, where do you think my brain's going right away? Your brain has a part of your, in your head, there's a thing called the reticular activating system, RAS. The RAS is designed to find things you like. Anybody ever buy a car, and then all of a sudden you see that kind of car, that same brand everywhere? I mean, everywhere. It's like, well, man, I didn't know there were so many cars like that. They're like everywhere. This one works, I mean, so easy. You could do it like today. This one's called priming. Priming is where I basically, or we can also call it a decoy. Priming is where I kind of, it's like a bait and switch. I kind of fix, I get your brain on one price and then I offer another. Anybody ever like watch those late night infomercials and they get you like, you know, it's $99,999, right? But for today only, you can get it for, it's kind of the same thing. This is a restaurant in Beaver Creek, Colorado. It's a steakhouse. They have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with a bottle of Cristal for $1.97. They don't sell a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches with Cristal. They sell a shitload of chilled mixed seafood platters for $87. Because of the price difference. They see $1.97, oh my God. And then they look at the next one, $87, sounds like a deal, right? Same thing. If I go back real quick, let me go back to this menu real quick. No, sorry. This one. If you look at this menu, this is also, I use, I use priming on this one. The buffalo ribeye is 42. I put right underneath it the ribeye for 35. I don't sell a lot of buffalo ribeyes in this restaurant. We sell a lot of ribeyes. Because 42 to 35, for people, that's like, wow, that's a big difference. That's called priming. It works great, especially if you're a higher-end restaurant and you have some perceived stuff that's a little bit higher, this works like gold to do that. Priming, priming, priming. Another thing, we have an association with symbols. If you look at this menu here, number one, I like the one on the right because it has really great, huge, big fonts. It's easy to read. The one on the left has some good fonts, but you can notice there's one thing on here, dollar signs. The average spend on menus without dollar signs actually increases 8%. You want to increase your spend 8% overnight? Take the dollar signs off. We have a thing, it's called semantic salience. Semantic salience means we have an association with symbols. Dollar equals pain. Hashtag write that down. Dollar equals pain. Take the dollar signs off, it actually shoots up your, your average spend 8%, which is awesome. Another one I love to do is I like to take out commas and I put in plus signs. This goes back to semantic salience. What does plus mean? Add, right? More value. This restaurant does the same thing. Kobe beef sliders, green chili plus cheddar cheese plus chipotle ketchup. And I want you to think about how people process words. They don't just read the words, they actually talk to themselves. When you're reading something, you're actually talking to yourself. Everyone understands that, right? So when you're talking to yourself, you're actually telling yourself a narrative. So I'm reading this going, you know, Kobe beef sliders. I, oh, I get green chili, plus I get, you don't say just there's a plus sign. You say, plus I get cheddar cheese, plus I get chipotle ketchup. Your brain always makes it sound like it's a better deal. If anyone ever has, like, price resistance on your menu, take the, take the commas off and put on plus signs. You'll see that you'll start getting less price resistance, especially if everyone said your prices are really high. Change that right away, and it'll change overnight. Also, put the pricing in the right spot. Number one pr <laughs> pet peeve I have is when restaurants put the price right next to the, to the title. 
They'll put like Kobe B sliders, nine, lobster wontons, 12, calamari, 11, and then they put the description. That's wrong. Remember how I process information? When you put that number up there, my brain automatically, because everyone has a budget when they come to your restaurant, if you know it or not. They might not even know it too, but they have kind of a, they have a price kind of level they'll go to. For some people, you can easily tell. For some people, you know, $100 for a watch is expensive. For some people, $10,000 for a watch is nothing. Because we all have different standards. We all have different levels of what our comfort zone is. When they come to your restaurant, everyone has a price point they're going to be stuck on. They might not even know it. But they have like, you know, when I see meatloaf on a menu, I see $19 for meatloaf. For some people, that's, wow, that's an expensive meatloaf, right? It depends on where you're from. It depends on your cultural background. It depends on where you grew up. It depends on your global belief systems. You always want to put the pricing at the end of the description. Remember how I want the thought process. This is the, ni- the item. I get this plus this plus this plus this for only $9. <coughs> oh, <coughs> this menu here is like a nightmare to me. This menu does a couple things. I would say, who uses a graphic designer to design their menus? Graphic designers make your menu look pretty. I always say pretty sometimes is not effective as far as when it especially comes selling. They want to make it look very symmetrical. They want everything in alignment. This menu here on the left, you can see the pricing is nice and neat up and down the side. It's called stacking. Do not stack your menu prices. That's like a bozo no-no. If you have menu pricing right now stacked, hold your left hand out, take your right hand, bad owner. Because you know what people are doing? They're actually, they're actually, what they're doing is they're looking at the price first. They're scanning up and down at the price, finding the price point they want, then they go backwards and read the menu. You're losing so many sales if you stack your prices. You're losing so many sales. A couple quick switches on your menu, I can increase your, I can increase the spend on your menu 15 to 20 percent overnight, just by following these little menu design tricks I just showed you. By implementing these little ones, you can easily tweak your menu and sell 15 to 20 percent more overnight by just making a couple simple changes, not having to raise your prices a penny. Just by changing a couple design features, you can actually get people to buy more in your restaurant. This one's like really, really dumb in the sense that not only do they have the prices stacked, but then they have the dot, 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 leading you right to the price. Dot, 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 right to the price. I hate that. Okay, let's talk about money. Money's important. Who thinks money's important? You guys don't think money's important? Wow, that's a weird crowd. This little part I'm going to talk to you about is from my profit clinic workshop. I want you to focus on what I call the right KPIs. KPIs are key performance indicators. Most restaurants look at their KPIs once a month, maybe once a week if I'm lucky. My clients look at their KPIs daily. And there's 12 KPIs they look at, 12 critical KPIs. There's restaurant utilization, cash flow, guest check average, prime cost, rev pash, Anybody heard of RevPash? It's one of my favorite ones. RevPash is revenue per available seat per hour. It is, I'm telling you, RevPash makes and breaks restaurant profitability. Discounts and comps, ideal guests per day, employee turnover, which is another huge bleed out for a lot of restaurants. They don't understand how much turnover is costing them. Profit margin, because at the end of the day, it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. Most restaurants are stuck on what I call vanity metrics, sales. What happened when COVID hit? Sales went, (laughs) crashed. All of my clients like freaked out. They freaked out because all their sales plummeted. I said, it's going to be okay. Let's not worry about the sales volume. Let's work about increasing our profitability. So what we did is we did a deep dive. We went back in and looked at their profits. We got them jacked up to their profitability 18% or higher. What happened when sales came back? Now their profits are even better than ever. Don't focus on vanity metrics. Focus on metrics that are actually you can actually have an impact on. Profit margin is everything. Then I break down, of course, labor costs, food costs, and beverage cost. The one I want to talk about today is called guest check average. It's my favorite one. Check average is by far the one you should have an impact on every damn day. 
And how do you do that? By talking to your team every day about it. You want to become what I call as a broken record. Your job as an owner is to basically be a preacher. You want to preach five things every day. Hashtag write this shit down. These are the five things you should preach every day. You should preach your mission, your core values, your vision, your standards, expectations, and you should be looking for good. Reaffirming positive behavior. I could go into any restaurant in the world and I could always pick out something bad. I, I, there's doesn't matter how great your restaurant is. You're doing something, or maybe somebody on the team's doing something wrong at any given time. But what if you actually go into your restaurant and start looking for what people are doing right and appreciate that, applaud that, reward that? You're going to see it changes your culture overnight. You can go in easily. You can chew them up and down, bark at them. <clears throat> Here's the thing I always say. If you beat a dog long enough, what it happens? The dog either bites you or it runs away. Either one of those I do not want. The five things, mission, core values, vision, standards and expectations, that's how I want it done. And then I'm always, I'm always giving positive affirmations. I'm always appreciating, rewarding, being grateful, pointing out the good. That's the five. Okay? Guest check average. Guest check average is what we call a multiplicative KPI compared to a linear, K, linear KPI. And I'm going to give you a real quick example. I'm going to have a baseline restaurant. So let's say I have a restaurant. They do 100 guests per day. They open five days a week. They have a $35 guest check average. So that's $3,500 in sales. That's $70,000 a month, which is almost a little over $800,000, $840,000 a year. <clears throat> food cost is, they have a 30% food cost, like the average. And then they have a 30% labor cost. And then their fixed expenses are kind of average too. They're 36% fixed expenses, all their other overhead. They're making around what the national average is. They're making 4% profit a year. So how do we take this to the next level? Consultant A comes in. Consultant A suggests, you know what you need? You need a new marketing campaign. We need to advertise. We need to promote. We need to do some discounts. We got to drive traffic to your place. How many ever heard a, a, a marketing consultant say, you need butts in seats? They all say it. You got to get butts in seats. I, I want butts in the seats, but I want them paying full price. <laughs> I want them discount. I don't want discount. I do not want to get on the discount wagon. So this, this uh, consultant suggests, hey, man, we're going to do is I'm going to increase your goal, your guest, 20%. Does that sound good? You go, yeah, 20% more guests would be awesome. I'd love that. So here's what happens. Consultant A's plan. Now I'm bumped up to 120 guests per day. I'm still open five days a week. I still have a $35 guest check average. Now my sales jump up to 4,200. That's nice. I like that. That's nice. That's actually up to 84,000 a month, which actually pushes us over that $1 million mark. The average independent restaurant in the United States does 1.1. That's the average full service restaurant in the United States does 1.1 million average. So they're pretty close to being the average restaurant. Now the food cost is still 30%. Labor cost is still 30%. But here's a cool thing, though, is that, you know, as your sales go up, your fixed expenses go down, right? Because a lot of those things are consistent, like your rent, stuff like that. You don't pay more rent as your sales go up. So your fixed expenses actually drop down, which is cool. Now, this consultant suggests that we need a billboard. We need a market to drive people from the highway because you're kind of isolated. And they also say that we're going to put some money back in advertising. So when it's all said and done, this consultant delivers $88,000 or an 8.8% .8 profit. They doubled your profit. That's pretty good, right? Who would like to double their profit? I mean, I, I think everybody would like to double their profit. Now, consultant B, oh, side note, guests per day is what we call a linear KPI. Now let's talk about multiplicative KPIs. Consultant B, which is Burns, I suggest what we do is we actually do some internal training with your staff. I teach them how to be edu educated on the menu better. I teach them how to pair stuff, how to upsell. I teach them about wine, about beers, how to pair stuff up with the meals. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say my goal is just to increase your guest check average by 20%, which I can do easily. Here's what happens when I do it. So now we're back to only 100 guests per day, less stress on the kitchen, a little bit calmer, Everyone kind of has time to talk to the tables. Everyone has time to really actually build a spirit of rapport, act in the essence of hospitality. 
We're still open five days a week. But here's where the magic starts happening. Now my guest check average drops, jumps up to $42 by 20% increase. Now I have $4,200 in sales. I also have $84,000 a month, and I'm still over that million dollar mark. My food cost is 30%. Here's where, again, the magic happens again, is my team now is more efficient because they're a little bit better trained. If, you're trained as, if your staff is trained better, and I have more A players and less C players, just so you understand right now, C players, you need two C players to make up for one A player, right? We've all seen it. I got to have two people sometimes work a station because they're not as good as they like that, my superstar A player. So now my team's really highly trained. So what happens there is my labor actually drops down 25%. And then also my fixed expenses drop down because, again, my sales jump up. Now here's what it's going to cost. You know, if someone hires me to come in for a day, it's $2,000 for me to come in and train your team for a day. But in the total end of it all, Here's what my, my program, by increasing your guest check average, is going to do for you. I'm going to increase your profit 14%. Just by changing the guest check average. Guest check average, again, is, the, is a multiplicative. It impacts more areas than you think. We want to focus on the right KPIs. Guest check average is a multiplicative KPI. The thing I always tell people is, like, focus on the right KPIs. Focus on the right KPIs. Here's what you need to do. You need to decide, commit to succeed. When you make a decision, what I mean by a decision is when you actually take the word. I'm, I'm a big study of words since I write so much. When you look at the word decision or decir, it actually comes from the Latin. It means from, it's the same thing as from incision. When you make a real decision from the Latin word decir, it means to cut off. There's like no going back. That's it. I made this commitment. This is my standard. I'm moving forward. We're not going backwards. So many restaurants start their standards up here, and then they get pushed back from the team, and they start dropping their standards a little bit at a time to your restaurants, not even, if, not even what you want, wanted it to be from the first place. Take a trip with me back in time to 1519. Hernan Cortez decides he's going to invade the Yucatan Peninsula and conquer the Aztecs. He takes 11 ships, takes 100 soldiers. He sets off to the Yucatan. And on the way there, the soldiers start hearing these rumors about the Aztecs, how brutal they are, that they don't take prisoners. In fact, they're going to cut your heart out and sacrifice it to their gods. And then they start thinking, like, this might not be a good idea. You know, no one's conquered the Aztecs for like 500 years, guys. So they land on the shores of the, of the Yucatan. A couple of the guys decide, you know what, we should steal a boat and take off. This is, this is, this is crazy. Cortez finds out about this, and what do you think he does? He orders the men, burn the boats. Because if we're not going to succeed, we're going to die here. That is the kind of philosophy you want to have. You want to have where I'm so committed to making sure my restaurant reaches the level of success I want that I'm willing to burn the boats. And so the last thing I'm going to say to you is this. I want you to make a commitment today to burn the boats. You've got to go all in. You got to go all in. I want to say thank you so much for showing up today. Thank you for being here. If you want, right in that booth right behind us, there's ovation. Right after this thing, I'm going to go over there. I'm going to actually be signing some books. I have some books available. If you come over to ovation, talk to Zach. He'll be more than happy to help you out. So I want to say thank you for showing up today. Thank you for being here. Please enjoy the show. Thank you.